the way we've been doing are doing this class this semester is that we really have two components. We have a discussion section, which is the students and getting to know each other, getting to know all of the material, etc. And then we have a series of weekly guest lecturers who, who are coming. And uh, for those of you who are interested, you're welcome to come to the second component, which is the guest lecture. And we keep our little other session uh, afternoon. So um, the other thing, too, is that for those of you who are interested and haven't seen previous guest speakers and for the future ones, um, I have asked each speaker for their permission for, this, for our ridiculous homebrew, for homebrew video method if we'd be put on the web. And every single person has graciously agreed, including today's speaker so, um, and next week uh, as well. So that, that's, uh, you can see it that way, too. Um, so the class, as most of you know, uh, is a critical assessment of how uh, the university's core mission is affected by intercollegiate athletics. Uh, course number is CS39Q, and I love the fact that it's Q because our number one thing is about questioning, so we can really try to get down to real facts uh, and try to distinguish the facts from the myths, uh, which is what we like to do in the academic world, and uh, this topic is replete with, with myths we've learned. So uh, we'll see today, and that's actually one of the reasons why I'm Really happy to have the athletics director here today because who better than to set us straight on what the real facts are than, uh, than the athletics director her, herself. Um, so she'll be telling us a lot of things and just to make sure everybody, just to start, uh, basically you are effectively the CEO of a $70 million company and you have 200 and how many employees? Uh, we're down to about 225. 225, like okay. 225. Um, and uh, so she'll be getting into, I suppose, more details along, along those lines. Um, I also want to tell you that she's graciously also agreed to answer questions as we go. So that's another aspect. And she's even going to be asking you a few, I hear. So you've got to stay awake. Um, so that's uh, pretty much it. So before I turn it over to her, let me just introduce her in terms of her background. Um, uh, Sandy Barber, uh, she received a BS degree in 1981 uh, from Wake Forest University of Physical Education. Uh, she has a master's degree in sports management from UMass in, from 1983, and then an MBA uh, from Northwestern in 1991, where you were also the assistant athletic uh, director, if I've got that right. Um, I was, I was so there somehow for, you were doing two things, or one well, after another? Well, no, I was or, there for nine years, the first seven as, a, as an assistant coach, and then as an assistant athletic director, and then I decided to go back to school full-time. Okay, great. Anyway, you went on to Tulane, and after that, Notre Dame, uh, and in September 2004, she joined us here as athletics director. So thank you so much for coming to talk with us. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, it's, uh, it's obviously a subject I'm very passionate about. Um, but it's also a subject that, uh, is, as, a, as campuses across the country, I mean, I've been doing this for 30 years. And it's all of the campuses that I've been on have engaged to various different degrees and at various different times in uh, this exact uh, examination, this exact subject. What, what is the place of intercollegiate athletics on a campus? Um, and I think it's a very healthy discussion. Uh, and obviously people come at it from different perspectives. Um, I think that uh, sports in our society, in our country, um, there, there's an, an infatuation uh, with competition uh, and with sports, both professional and, uh, and at the college level, um, that, that leads to uh, some of the, the passion uh, that we find on our campuses and, uh, and within our communities and alumni bases that, that then kind of give rise uh, to some of what I sh I'm sure you all have been talking about um, for uh, for the semester, uh, and that we will we will talk about and, and, and look at from one perspective uh, today. Quite frankly, um, there I, I come from a, cam a family of, of educators, uh, elementary school and, and and high school. I consider myself uh, an educator, and there are lots of conversations that we have around uh, the uh, the family dinner table about the role of sports in our society, and uh, you know. This is going to seem odd for me to say, but I do think from a cultural and a societal standpoint, um, there are times when it's very much overblown. But the fact is that it, it is what it is in our culture, and different enterprises, and, and colleges and universities are certainly one of them, have, have to... Um, uh, have to uh, acknowledge that and, and have to deal with it in terms of the place it holds uh, 
in, uh, in their enterprise. Let me ask you, um, uh, the students, uh, there aren't, aren't that many of you, so I think we can do this fairly quickly. Uh, either tell me what was it that, uh, that piqued your interest about this class, or you've had a series of phenomenal uh, presenters. Uh, is there some, what, what, give me something um, that, uh, that has surprised you, that you didn't know coming into this class. That I didn't know coming into this class? Well, or or what, what, what drew you to this class? Either one. Pick, pick one of those two. Um, well, what I learned recently from speakers is um, I came into this class thinking that uh, intercollegiate athletics, like football teams and basketball, brought in money, like brought in more money than it actually used. And I guess from the past speakers and the research that I've done, it, that isn't the case. Hmm. For, for intercollegiate athletic programs as totals, or as the football team, or as the basketball team? As total. Okay. Yeah. Good one. Yeah. Um, I kind of got interested in, um, I, I didn't know exact at, at all what, what athletics and what role does it play. I come from Europe, so mm -hmm. there we have a very different uh, look on education and, and, and athletics. Um, but I'm very... Um, yeah, very much um, curious about uh, like the, the enormous amounts of money that goes on in this industry and kind of where does it go um, in terms of, you know, uh, kind of looking at the, at the players as workers who, um, you know, produce something. Mm, so part of this, this pay, pay for play or cost of attendance issue uh, relative to student athletes and their scholarships. Right. Okay. Well, I decided to take this class because it was just a subject I knew so little about. Like, I heard about it a lot in the media and stuff, but no one I personally knew knew a lot about it, so I just wanted to learn. Um, I was looking for a freshman seminar, and this was the only class analyzing athletics, and I was like, wow, that's extremely interesting. Uh, I personally, I, I played a couple sports, but not to the intercollegiate level, and so I was extremely curious as to its role at our academic institution. Great. Um, besides the whole like financial aspect, I'm more interested in actual the student athletes and what they have to um, do. Because for me, I'm just a student. Obviously, I'm not an athlete, and so <coughs> I have many friends who are athletes, and they have to go through different things. And, and in a way, like I want to see how they are um, experiencing their college experience and what they're um, like experiencing, basically. So I want to know know more about college athletes, basically. Um, what drew me to this class is I grew up a huge Cal fan, went to football games as a little kid, you know, was really happy when I was coming here because I could finally be in the student section holding up the cards. And that's why I initially took this class. But then the more I, like, learned in this class, the more the financial aspects of it um, kind of piqued my interest. The NCAA and the whole, like, cartel, or people calling it cartel and stuff like that made me really think about the role that intercollegiate athletics play in our culture. Great. Well, I think I never expected this much con controversy because, um, yeah, before I kind of just thought, like, having a big-time athletic um, team would be a benefit to a college, but I didn't know there was that much pros and cons to having a big-time college. Um, Absolutely. Trade-offs. Um, what drew me to the class is when I looked on the freshman seminar website and I saw, um, I didn't, you know, um, I was kind of interested in the, um, Kind of how strong the relationship is between uh, the educational, the university, and, and uh, its educational mission, as well as the intercollegiate athletics. And I was interested in, like, I guess, just how like strong the relationship is, like how interrelated those two mm -hmm. areas are. What I found interesting is the uh, the difference between the name Cal and the name Berkeley, and who mm -hmm. owns the brand. We could do a whole course on that, couldn't we? <laughs> Uh, I was looking through the freshman seminars, and then uh, this one stood out to me because uh, I'm really interested in sports. And I was reading the course description, and I thought it'd be an interesting like course to take on a different perspective other than my own. Yeah. Outstanding. Okay. Well, that uh, that gives me great hope that uh, uh, that what I have to say today. I don't. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna be able to answer uh, everything that uh, I wish I brought a student with me. We could do a student athlete with me. We could do a day in the life. Uh, it's best, I think, you know, coming from uh, from from their eyes. But but I think I can give you um, 
I think I can give you the, the perspective uh, from, uh, from an athletic department standpoint and certainly bring to it some examples of, uh, of some of the value, of some of the trade-offs. Uh, you know, we, we talked about the, the, the pros and the cons. There are definitely pros and cons. Um, and, uh, and, and there are ways that intercollegiate athletics can be done that make it a much more make it a valuable proposition to a university versus other ways that actually um, uh, whether you want to talk financially or you want to talk in terms of contribution or denigration of a university's brand, um, absolutely. Um, my points today are, are going to be very simple. Uh, I think that. Um, I believe very strongly that athletics done right, again back to the point I, I was just making, uh, that athletics done correctly can be a great contributor of great value to, uh, to a university campus, uh, to the academic mission, uh, to the community, and to the overall mission uh, of the university. Uh, it, it, there, again, it, has to, it absolutely has to be done in a certain way. It has to be done in a, in a way that is a fit uh, for, for the particular university. Obviously, Berkeley is different from Notre Dame, is different from Tulane, is different from Alabama, is different from the University of Maryland, is different from Williams, Harvard, Princeton, uh, etc. So athletics is going to fit properly uh, in, in different ways uh, across different campuses. But one thing I, I want to get across uh, very strongly is probably the biggest objection I have to the debate, and it's been the debate here, it's been the debate at Notre Dame, it's been the debate um, at Tulane, uh, is about w that, that athletics may or may not be part of the, the teaching and learning and education on a campus. Um, because I believe very strongly that it is, and in particular, it's it's a part of the the core mission and and the teaching and and learning for a relatively small number of students. Absolutely, those student athletes that participate in the programs, and for us, that's 850 uh, to to 900. Uh, it's it's uh, there are teaching and learning opportunities relative to other students around. Uh, Intercollegiate athletics, whether it be the band or Rallycom or Cal Spirit or uh, the Oski guys or Mike Men or, or, or whoever it is. Um, and, and then I think that there are a variety of opportunities for other students, depending on uh, their interactions with athletics, that are very much teaching uh, and, and learning. Yes? I, I was actually just going to ask you to elaborate on that, how, how um, people the students around the programs who are not actually involved in the in the athlete, uh, athletics how what do well they their mean? their pursuits whether it be the band or rallycom or mike men or or, uh, or or cal spirit are um, the, the 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 organization and the leadership experience that they get is centered centered around um, whatever their service or activities are for for athletics activities so absent those athletics activities, they wouldn't have that experience. So it, it, it certainly is, you know, the circles move out a little bit um, in terms of their direct connection to athletics. But uh, I believe that for the athletics opportunity, they have they have that uh, they have that experience. Okay. Uh, am I taking questions from non-students? <laughs> if you want to, it's up to you. Just wanted to clarify: what's the total enrollment at Cal now? Because you mentioned in the 900, 850 to nine hundred. Uh, undergraduates were about 30? I think it's about 25,000 undergraduates and about 10,000 so, graduates, but I'm not positive. That's so is it? 25. 20, 25. 25. No. 35,000. 35,000 total, 25 and 10. Thank you. Okay, so the value of intercollegiate athletics. Um, I can go through these relatively quickly because uh, I think we've we've all heard them. We may agree to varying different degrees uh, that they that they exist and 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 how to quantify them or or that they can't be quantified. Um, I will also make a comment at this point. Uh, I think at best the, the 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 overall research about intercollegiate athletics out there is um, inconclusive. I don't think that. There is, is research that solely says um, that intercollegiate athletics does one thing, is a, you know, does not 
uh, create revenue. Uh, I don't think, I certainly don't think that there is conclusive uh, research out there that says it absolutely does. I think that there are a variety of, and I'm going to talk about some of them, there are a variety of different circumstances uh, that dictate how you would compute, how you would monetize the value of intercollegiate athletics to any, to any campus. Um, and, and so, you know, I certainly, uh, and I know it's not from a, uh, from a research standpoint uh, what, what uh, goes on necessarily in the academy, um, but I think you have to take it campus by campus um, and really delve into to that campus's situation um, to, to have a good idea of, uh, of the value and the, and the monetization of it. Question really quick on that? Yeah. On that point. So what is it for Cal's campus? Uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about, well, and, and then we can, we can, if you have specific questions about it, we can. Okay. Um, so overall, the value of intercollegiate athletics, you know, certainly combines. Uh, actually, to to your point, um, in the United States, we combine athletics at the college level uh, with uh, with the the um, uh, the pursuit of uh, of an education like no one else in the world. Uh, they are they are separate in in almost every other country. Uh, they they are separated. But from the standpoint of, I believe, and I'm sure there is an opposing view, uh, that that we have decided that there is some value, uh, if nothing else, to to the community and and the things that uh, that come with that uh, to to combine them in our higher education in this country. Uh, from the ancient Greeks, certainly athletic pursuits have been recognized as a valuable, co valuable component of the complete education uh, education process. And then there, you know, we talked about it just a little bit. There are values that accrue um, to the student per, uh, participants. Uh, certainly to to our student athletes, it's things like uh, discipline, teamwork, confidence, leadership, mental toughness, uh, being a part of something bigger than oneself. Um, and the values that competition brings uh, to, the, uh, to the pursuit of excellence. Provides a platform for promotion of the university brand, uh, whether it be uh, national television exposures, uh, whether it be uh, newspaper. Um, I don't necessarily, there, there's always been this argument out there that if you added up all the column inches uh, and what that would cost in advertising, uh, that, you know, that that's the value. Uh, I don't know that I completely buy that. Uh, but at the same time, I don't think that you can say that, that the, the promotion of the brand, the opportunities, again, with excellence, that, that's done in a way that brings a value, brings brings pride and if you want to it brings honor to the university uh, that's that's part of the equation um, uh, to help extend the brand mm -hmm. yes. um, is, do you think that um, it supplements in any way or is it more central than the a prestigious university like Berkeley or like how does it really need a program to kind of get its name out there because it is already so famous in the academic world Sure. Uh, I, I think the words you use in terms of supplement, it might reach, I believe it does reach, um, a different uh, and perhaps a broader audience than we might otherwise with, with strictly um, a, an academic brand message um, that I think brings value added relative to uh, admissions applications. Uh, relative to donors or corporate sponsors uh, that that, uh, that want to associate themselves with the university. Uh, intercollegiate athletics, uh, every place I've been, and again this is campus by campus, but certainly uh, where all the campuses that I've been contributes to campus diversity, um, and it creates tremendous passion around the university. Now I put in parentheses there, obviously that's back to pros and cons, high risk, high reward. Uh, there's lots of positive that can be brought uh, to the university through athletics competition. Uh, there is certainly negative that can be brought uh, to the university, whether it is uh, through student athletes or athletic department staff members who don't behave appropriately, uh, or whether it is through uh, financial difficulties. Uh, there are a number of ways uh, with most enterprises um, that, uh, that, that positive and negative can be brought to the university. At what cost? Okay. Uh, my assumption is that you all have, have already done some of this through your examination, uh, but at my last count, there are only seven programs out of, and I'm only looking at Division 1A, there are seven programs, does that fit with, yeah. about with, uh, that do not require 
uh, institutional support in order to fund their athletic programs. And that's out of? Uh, 122 at, uh, at, at 1A. And I, uh, I don't believe, I can't think of a, a one AA program that's, uh, uh, that, that's, that's, um, that's not operating with some kind of subsidy. There are many forms uh, of this support. It can be cash support. It can be through student <coughs> fees. Uh, it can be uh, with uh, either tuition remission, uh, tuition waivers, or services that are provided uh, to athletics at, at no cost. Now, these seven, um, let's see, it's Notre Dame, <coughs> University of Texas, uh, Purdue, uh, I'm going to run out here, Penn State, Florida. Um, US, I'm sorry? Florida. Actually, that's yeah, not no, correct. No, I'm glad you mentioned they that. Say it. Ah, that's exactly my point. It used to be. Maybe it was. Maybe they said they were. <laughs> because that, that's, you, you, you guys are, make, are making my point for me, is that they say they are, but they're not, Florida's not counting, uh, I've got it later in a, in, a, in a grid here, I think it's about two and a half million dollars in student fees that they receive. Now, if you want to have your definition of institutional support not include student fees, okay, that's fine. I'll, I'll buy that. Yeah. When you say that Notre Dame doesn't require institutional support and that you've been there, does that change like the dynamic between IA and the school? That's a great question. Um, yes, but not as much as you might think it would. Um, I'd never till before I went to Notre Dame. I'd never been anywhere that 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 didn't have, didn't require institutional support. And I thought that by going to Notre Dame, that, um, uh, that the fact that Notre Dame not only fully supports its intercollegiate athletic program, but provides, when I was there, it was about 12 million, I don't know what it is today, um, but uh, when I was there, provided 12 million dollars, provided the entire NBC contract back to the university for student, for student scholarships. Not student athletic, not student athlete scholarships, but, but student scholarships. And um, there was still the same debate. It had a little different tone to it and a little different nuance to it, but it was about, well, athletics should be providing more to, to campus. And as well as the same debates about, should we have admitted this, this student? Should we, have, should we be doing this in athletics? Should the football team be staying in a hotel the Friday night before home games? Um, so you still have that same debate, interestingly, interestingly enough. Um, so you, let's say you have a place that, uh, uh, that is, is zero uh, institutional support, but is completely break even, isn't giving anything to the university. Perhaps the debate is, they should be. Uh, they should be turning over parts of this increased television contract uh, to the university. So that's a, I think that's a natural debate. Um, athletics. You know, has parts of it that are not a natural fit with the campus. I get that, absolutely. But those are kind of the, to me, those are the educational tensions um, that, uh, that, that we work through. Um, other factors that impact the cost of the program, breadth of the program, I think significantly one of, one of our issues. It's one of, one of our issues that I love. I love the fact we have 29 programs. But of those 29 sports, to make money, back to, to your point, to make money, and 27 cost, need to, need to be supported. And frankly, they're being supported by the money that these two make. They're being supported by the institutional support. And they're being supported by philanthropy from our, from our donor community. Um, but it's expensive to have 29 programs. Uh, I'll give you just a, a, a quick frame of reference. Uh, we have, uh, uh, we're, we have our, our budget is about 70 million. We have 850 student athletes, um, and we have 29 programs. University of Oregon, in our own conference, has about a 70 million dollar budget. Actually, I think it's about 68 maybe. Uh, they have 350 student athletes and 19 programs. Order of magnitude, same budget for almost a third of the student athletes. So just a, just a, a, an interesting framing. Um, breadth of program, number of students, uh, local cost of living, uh, which which impacts your your uh, 
uh, what you're doing from a compensation standpoint, just like on every, uh, every part of the campus. Um, and then campus re recharge structure. Um, I thought about not throwing that in there because it, it gets, uh, uh, it kind of muddies the waters a little bit. But it is part of, uh, you know, the four schools I've been at, um, there are very different situations about, we have something called full costing. I don't know whether you all have been introduced to, I know, I know our faculty members have been introduced to it. Uh, but it, I mean, it's basically, it's a revenue tax. And it's, it's to help the university do its business, the, the, the central business. So for every dollar we bring in, and this is true of the entire campus, uh, we get charged 7% on, ev on every dollar that comes in from the television contract, that comes in uh, on a ticket. And it's, how, it's how the university does its business. Other places recharge from a, but that's a federal formula, right? Is that, yeah. Okay. But I think it's higher, departments add more to the tax, so it's actually what reaches us is getting close to 13%. Yeah. Or unrestricted so, gifts. Unrestricted. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's the same concept with, just something percent. with more nuances. Yeah. Well, yeah. Much more higher magnitude. Yeah. Um, so, so that certainly has an impact on, uh, on what your, what your net, net funding looks like. Um, how, do, how, do, how do these values uh, contribute to the core mission? Well, and I'll certainly, I think, a sense of community uh, that contributes both quantitatively uh, and qualitatively to the core mission of the university. I've talked about um, you know, what I believe is certainly in terms of those closest uh, to the programs in terms of from a student standpoint, that there, there is uh, definitely a, a teaching and learning um, component that, that goes on. Um, and also the positive exposure of platform um, provides an extension for the university brand. Uh, which certainly you know, is, is at its core. Mm -hmm. It's so offensive, I cannot tell you. I don't mm. mind what you're saying. Okay. But the word brand to me brings Nike, not academic excellence. Or reputation. It's a very offensive term. It's, more of, it's more of a commercial term. It's totally a commercial okay. term. Okay. Fair enough. I appreciate that. Um, so we could, uh, I, I think there are some. Um, there are some times when it, it, th there is more of a, uh, of a commercial element to it, but in terms of the overall message, I'm trying to, it, I would use reputation that you're correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can we monetize the benefits of highly vis visible athletics? Uh, and this is where I think you know, it, it becomes a, a matter of, uh, of perspective. It becomes a matter of university to university, uh, uni uh, from camp campus to, to, to campus. But, you know, can we monetize the benefit of, of the media, the television, the newspaper, billboards, radio? Um, can, uh, from an admissions application standpoint, there, uh, there is, there are plenty uh, of, uh, there's plenty of data about places that, uh, their applications uh, increased exponentially uh, after some kind of uh, uh, significant athletic uh, achievement. Uh, one of the ones that, that uh, I, I personally was a part of was when Northwestern went to the Rose Bowl in uh, 1995. Uh, and uh, that university will tell you, uh, I think their applications went up 20%. Probably not a big impact. On, on Berkeley, not uh, and uh, have already driven the quality of the, the pool up uh, based on reputation uh, and certainly based on um, on, the, on those numbers on, on an annual basis. But there are places uh, where that certainly can can be a benefit. Question? Uh, yes. Real quick. Um, so uh, kind of for the first bullet point, uh, also kind of re related to the community that the university already has. Do you think that? Um, like in, as in Europe, we we have that sort of sense of community around the 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 sports and enterprise outside of the, uh, mm -hmm. the your, your club system university, right? Yeah. But um, so, is there like a particular um, benefit to having it associated with the university? Or well, I think I think the benefit to 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 having it be associated with the university as, as opposed to having it be separate is that then those um, those connections the university gets the benefit of the connection uh, well, let's go straight to the to the donor point uh, you know someone that doesn't live in California maybe lives overseas or lives on the East Coast their connection 
might be, in large numbers, uh, their connection through athletics, through coming back uh, to football games. And once they get, they, they, they decide to come back for a football game, but they're here and they visit their home school. They visit some of their faculty members. They, 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 do, they do obviously a lot of other things on campus. Athletics is a lot of times referred to as the front porch. Um, I think with a, a, a university of Berkeley's reputation, uh, I think we are less of the front porch uh, than, than a lot of other places are. Uh, but I'll give you some examples uh, when, we, when we look at, uh, at, um, at donations of, of where we very much have served as the portal for someone from a film, for a large number of people from a philanthropic standpoint. Thank you. Um, just some numbers uh, to set some context. You all may have, have already done this. Yes? May I just, uh, you know, you, in, on your last slide you talked about uh, building community mm -hmm. and supporting the, the core mission. Um, you know, when I see, I know football schools, Florida for instance, and um, the community that that builds detracts from their educational mission. Uh, in my opinion, I, I can feel it. I, I can see the direction that the university is going in academically. Um, at Cal, there's already a community, uh, a sense of community, and it's based on its reputation or brand of an academic institution that is at the peak of a public university. Um, that to see this, so what I see going on now is uh, what you would call an extension of the brand. Marketing, marketing, they talk about extending the brand, uh, rebranding actually. What happens though is that as you extend this brand, uh, you inevitably end up rebranding the school. And so for Cal, it's not Michigan where there's already a long history of this being intertwined. At Cal, it's not in the actual, in our DNA, uh, to be a big time football school. But I think excellence is in our DNA. But by, by, what I see this is really trying to, to present uh, the positive benefits of uh, going big on football, putting all your chips on the table, is that this it, it creates a, a better school. And I'm, I think it's going to create more of a football school. And that the fact that uh, Cal is not very successful at football is a blessing. If they really were successful, <laughs> In a way, in a way, it's a, it's a blessing. I, I go to the games, so I. I but in, in the long term, it it you know this rebranding, uh, it just. Uh, see, I don't I don't see I don't see it as re. Uh, we're we're going to disagree. Well, it's going to end on, up as rebranding. Um, I don't believe it is uh, because I believe, and I'll go back to my original statement that for athletics to be valuable, um, it needs to. Um, uh, it needs to contribute to, and I'm, I'm going to stay with Laura's term, uh, it needs to contribute to the reputation in a way that the reputation has been built. It, it needs to be part of the DNA as opposed to any, any repositioning uh, of, of that. And, and so absolutely, athletics to, to contribute that value has to be, has to be good. And you're, going to see, you're going to see this in, in, in some of the things that, uh, that I'm talking about here. Okay, so just, just some context. Um, this was uh, FY 2010, um, and, uh, and from a total athletics budget, we are, we are down uh, uh, from there where we are today in, in 2012. But these are all level set for, um, for, 2000, uh, for 2010. But total athletics budgets, um, you see that institutional support, it ranges from, uh, where's Rutgers in there? At, uh, it's like 27, 27 million. Uh, yeah, 26.8 million on a 54 uh, million dollar budget. Uh, also, just uh, threw in a, a couple of others uh, to, sh I mean, Tulane, my old, uh, my old stomping grounds. Also, just to, to look at the size of, of their budget relative to, to some of these others and, and trying to compete. Um, and then, you know, Harvard and Princeton are spending uh, respectively 13 million and 15 million. They don't have as they have uh, many of the same costs we do, uh, but but not as many of the uh, of the revenue opportunities. Uh, but but they're investing in athletics uh, for, for a reason. Um, I'm sorry, so I, I don't really want to be difficult, but that's actually, can you go back? Yeah. Just to clarify the facts? Sure. So you wrote on the top total athletics budget. Mm -hmm. So this gets, I know you are, this is something I was going to ask you offline, but yeah. you're the athletics director, but actually just to be clear, you, you, your uh, 
purview is intercollegiate athletics. We Correct. have also rec sports. Which is a separate Which program. is separate. So yep. when you say total athletics budget. Total you're... intercollegiate athletics budget. Okay, so the problem is, this is actually not correct what you have technically speaking. Yep. Because at Harvard, um, they don't have a separate intercollegiate athletics program and a athletics program for the campus. They have a single program and uh, and some and some and of the rest of these probably do too. You're absolutely yeah, right. But Harvard, I haven't know a lot about so because my apples. colleague in computer science is the former dean of this the college. This is not apples. To apples. It's right. nowhere, It's not even apples to celery. <laughs> because Harvard has about three quarters of their students participating, we have one or two percent. Uh, their entire coaching staff put together of head coaches uh, receives less money than our one head coach of football. I mean, it is a completely different type of thing. So that's a very misleading comparison. Uh, it, it, it is, and I had not I had not thought of the rec sports issue when I when I put this together. You're absolutely right about that. Um, my only point in, in doing this, and, and I should go out, uh, I should, and I actually have it, which is crazy of me not to have done this. Um, uh, if we were to pull out what that institutional support is for athletics, my only uh, point in putting Harvard and Princeton down there was that Harvard and Princeton are investing in intercollegiate athletics, and, and, and they are to, uh, to some degree. I think, I think the numbers are probably uh, somewhere between seven and nine million. That's, that's not to rec sports. I, I actually asked that question was told they couldn't distinguish it, but I want to say one last thing. They also told me that they have more than 40 different sports, which is interesting. In That's true. What they're talking about. Yeah, it's very and true. They have all kinds of things. They welcome people, anything. In fact, I was told that if a group of students get together and want to have a sport of some obscure, I don't know, you know, Nor 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 Northern Ireland version of uh, tiddlywink throwing, if they can get enough people together, they'll run that sport. So That's it's a very that's different kind of That's philosophy. true here in our rec in our rec sports. Our rec sports. Okay. Yeah. Question number two. Um, yes. Do you think that uh, it's like the ratio of students that actually participate in the sport? Is it more kind of morally just that you spend more of the student fees and more of the, the institutional support that goes to the students that actually do the sports, as opposed to kind of uh, investing it into this? more of the, the, the stuff around it as well. I think that goes back to, to, to the larger question. I'm sure different people's answers are going to be different to that. Um, it goes back to the larger question of what does investing in athletics bring to the campus? Um, and, right. then, and then I think if, if you value that, I think you can answer that as a yes. If you don't value it, I, I think clearly your answer is, is going to be a no. Right, but is it like better to spend more if, if more people are involved as opposed to Spending more on less people involved in, in the actual sport. I think what you need to you need to maximize the the resources to be able to produce the value to the campus, um, and and that's going to be different in, in, in different in different places. Um, yeah, can, can since we're coming down to the end here, can I, I just let me just get through the I've got like two more slides I think. Um, so the, to the degree that institutional support is is minimized, trade offs occur. You know, if we're dependent, if we have very little campus support, uh, or minimal campus support, or no campus support, uh, we're reliant upon uh, some degree of uh, of commercialism. We we can, and, and when I'm talking, I'm not necessarily talking Cal, although certainly there's some of that. But as a as an enterprise, uh, we're certainly seeing this in intercollegiate athletics. We're a slave to television. Um, we're starting we're starting uh, football and basketball contests on all kinds of nights and days of the week. Um, and at all kinds of different times because of um, the, uh, uh, the revenue that's coming from television. And then I think we all know that the conference realignment that we're currently going through uh, and, uh, and that we will continue to go through is all motivated uh, by that need for, for additional revenue. And then the pressures to win uh, and uh, the, the, the kinds of uh, compromises or, uh, or, or situations uh, that, uh, that we're, we're faced with. And when I talk about pressure to win, it's pressure to win uh, to, to be good in football and basketball uh, to produce uh, the revenue. Um, let, me, let me just, uh, you can, can look at that if, if you want, but let me give you the crux of, of these next two slides so that we can, uh, I can finish my thought and we can, uh, we can have as many questions as possible in the last 10 minutes. Um, I would love for intercollegiate athletics on this campus, on my old campuses, on any other campuses, to have them cost less. 
I think we found as a campus, we found out as a campus, how passionate a relatively large and influential group of our community is and, and you know, what their reaction was to our announcement that we were going to cut five programs uh, a year ago. I think that they stood up and, and to me they brought evidence of, of all the things that the research is not necessarily proving or disproving that intercollegiate athletics is very, very important to our community. Um, and they, they, they need to be, we need to be, athletics needs to be competitive. It needs to be part of the excellence reputation. Um, it needs to be done uh, with students that, that have a reasonable uh, opportunity uh, to navigate our, our curriculum and who are engaged in what we're doing um, academically. Um, but we live in a very, very competitive environment and we need to do something uh, regulatory, legislatively, uh, to have an opportunity to reduce our costs, uh, whether it's through uh, personnel. Um, unfortunately, uh, we, we can't, uh, from a, from a um, compensation standpoint, uh, antitrust, uh, we, we, we tried that as the NCA to live, we had something called a, a restricted earnings coach. They could only make uh, 12600 a year, uh, and the NCA. this was, uh, John, probably 15 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, um, we got slapped with a $60 million uh, lawsuit. Um, but we certainly should attempt uh, to, uh, to, to level uh, the, the, the playing field. We have to reduce the, the, um, the cost of creating and maintaining competitive success. Um, and if we do that across the board, I think we then have an opportunity. Um, to, uh, to, to, to accomplish what I think everybody in this room would, would like to accomplish, uh, which is to have athletics have the opportunity to be the powerful vehicle uh, that it can be, uh, but at, at less of a cost um, to, uh, to the university. Um, so, that's got through the slides. There was a question here for Doug. I just wanted to give you the opportunity to state the figures for Cal if we included the intercollegiate, all the figures of, of our um, recreational, sports. recreational sports. I do not know what rec sports budget is. But well, rec sports is a very small number compared to this. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I Most students pay their own fees mm -hmm. for their sports. Okay. To ask you a question about the slave to television. Mm -hmm. Okay, you've got a new TV contract coming, and it's going to progressively uh, get get bigger payouts. Um, what percentage of that money will be used to eliminate the campus subsidy? Well, that money is being used to get us down to the five. That uh, maybe you can what the five means. Uh, we are currently um, this year at a little bit above 10 in terms of institutional support, a uh, combination of reg, student reg fee and, uh, and chancellor support. Uh, and that is by FY14 uh, at the chancellor's direction going down to 5 million. The entire combination? Yes. Yeah. Including yeah. the student reg fee? Yes. We've, so we've, and yeah. how much are the student reg fees? 2.1. 2.1, 2.2, something um, I'd first like to begin by thanking you. I really do appreciate you coming here to give us a different perspective on this topic. Um, I have a lot of questions, but for starters, uh, do you think wild cards are appropriate for a research one school and nonetheless themselves? A wild card? Yes, those are... Uh, uh, so basically, um, what's, what's athletes are selected and put, um, allowed into the school under the title that they stay as an athlete and not because of their academics. It's not with academic standing of our university. Well, so, so they bring a talent to the, well, the, ultimately if you're, if you're talking about um, uh, admissions exceptions, exception by, uh, admission by exception, um, sorry, I never heard it called a wall card. <laughs> um, I, I do think it's appropriate, um, but I, do, I think it's appropriate uh, maintaining uh, that those decisions are made by our admissions professionals um, or our admissions committee, whatever the, uh, whatever the mechanism is at the university, uh, and that they are made uh, based on the professional's assessment of whether or not that student can, uh, has a chance to successfully navigate the curriculum. Okay. 
But the admissions committee for athletes and admission committees for the general student population are two different committees, right? Uh, that is my understanding, yes. But they are that they are faculty and admissions professional. They are not they're not athletic so. Just for organization, we have five minutes left, so if everybody can keep their questions short and maybe if your answer's short, we get as many as possible. That'd be great. If things are possible, you guys can do that if possible. Well, thanks. One thing that I learned by attending some of these talks was that some fraction of the, say, the football players uh, feels very much exploited. That they feel that they brought a, they're brought here under the wrong pretense, that their maybe boyish dream that they will play in the professional league at some point was not put into perspective. I guess uh, there's like at least 30, maybe 50% of the people coming actually think that that will be their career, when in reality it's maybe one or two percent. And then that they're sacrificing maybe the real dream they had about their education they wanted to get for this more hokey kind of dream. And then when it doesn't work out in the end, they feel sort of exploited. What, um, what do you see from the inside and how do you deal with those issues? Yeah, it's, um, that, that's an interesting question because I think that's, um, that's a question that as an intercollegiate athletics enterprise we have, we have to face. Mm -hmm. um, there's no doubt, I, I would actually say the percentage of those um, in any one of our sports that has a realistic professional uh, is, is higher than 30 or 40 percent. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say um, and this is part of what keeps me going every day. There's a lot in intercollegiate athletics across this country that I see that, that really leaves a bad taste in my mouth. And I'm, I'm at Cal, and I was at Notre Dame, and I was at Tulane, and I was at Northwestern, because I wanted to be part of what was right about it. And there is no doubt in my mind, one of the things I am most proud of about being at Berkeley is that we do talk to these young men and young women, but they, they come here because of the education. There are a lot, first of all, we get negative recruited. Um, I'm sorry, Brian, I can't keep this one brief. <laughs> we, get, we get negative recruited. Oh, you don't want to go there, it's gonna be, it's gonna be too hard, okay? And we say, you know what, they're insulting you, and it is hard here. And if you want the education, it's worth the work that you will do. Um, I think our biggest challenge right now I, I think that, that what you're talking about, I'm not saying that there aren't young men in our program that, that feel that way, um, but I think we have a higher percentage of those that maybe get disillusioned with football or disillusioned with basketball or disillusioned with whatever it is, but they at least have the education to fall back on. In some places, they're not getting it. Okay? Yeah. Oh, um, I was wondering, uh, what is your salary and then what is the salary of a professor that's been here a while, like Brian? And what's the salary of Jeff Tepper? And do you think they're reasonable? <laughs> uh, <laughs> let, let me let me uh, answer the, the, the last piece because uh, all of that is public. I'd, I'd, I'd have to uh, I refer to our faculty about the average faculty uh, salaries. Uh, all of it's public. Um, Jeff is at uh, 2.3 million. Um, I'm at a little bit above uh, 400. And um, no, I wish I wish. That, uh, that those weren't the salaries, because I think that's part of where we are uh, out of whack. But if we're going, we going to be excellent, if we're going to have a successful intercollegiate athletics program, um, we, we, have to, we have to pay market. Okay? Yes, you can your hand. Uh, thank you. Um, you mentioned the phrase, we're a slave to television. Now, the university decides on what contracts it wants to make with other entities. I know that Notre Dame, I was as, watching their... As part of a conference. Yes, yep. I was watching the game on television. Their statement was made, Notre Dame is playing a very, very rare night game. So one can make arrangements so that you can control your time if that, that's a priority. Now, if you're a slave to television, it doesn't really mean much to you because you have the stadium, you can schedule the game whenever you want, you can do anything, but it's a... It makes the community a slave to you and your decisions. And that's what I think is something that needs to be considered when you talk about building community. So many of the university's decisions are made completely without input of the community or any concerns for the community's needs. And Doug, that was actually part of my point when, when, I, when I put that up there, is that because we are so dependent upon those resources, we make decisions that, it, that in a more ideal and a more perfect world, I mean, I would like our games to be at 12.30 every Saturday. That's my personal preference. 
I'm sure others might say 2.30. Or, I don't think anybody would prefer a night game, even if they have kids that are playing soccer during the day and some, and some other things. Um, but you, you've actually made my point. Um, <coughs> by, by having less institutional support, we are, uh, and, and I'm not saying that that's the wrong decision. That these are all trade-offs. Uh, but that it, it does force us in, in that direction. Yeah. You talked about conference realignment. So, like, say hypothetically we get those super conferences that everyone's been talking about. How do you think that would affect Cal specifically? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I am on film here, right? <laughs> uh, I, I actually am very concerned uh, about these super conferences and what they are doing to some of the tradi traditions um, in, in college athletics. Uh, what they everybody talks about um, football and men's basketball and why these alignments are you know would be good or bad or would produce more revenue, um, but nobody's talking about the volleyball team being flown all over the country. Um, nobody's talking about the tennis team um, that you know that has to uh, that, that is going to have to go in, in the scenario to Texas to Lubbock, Texas. Um, so I am. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad we are the 12 that we are as a, as a Pac-12 conference, and uh, I um, again, this is one of those those trade-offs in in search of revenue so that we can uh, meet our obligations to institutional support or lessen the institutional support. Those those are things that um, you know that we're exploring that I don't think are healthy. Uh, can we take one last question, maybe for Sandy? Yeah, um on people's minds. Uh, when the chancellor's got a big boost in salary, and Chancellor Tim thought it was wrong, so he took his big boost and put it into scholarships for undergraduates. Any chance that you and Tedford would do the same? Well, um, you know, when we, um, when we uh, had the furlough and the university couldn't contractually um, require uh, us as contract folks to do that. We we both volunteered. Um, the the f actually I went a, I went beyond uh, the percentage. But Ted oh wait, that's not right either. I'm sorry to say, but unless I misunderstand in terms of. Uh, I took it on. Oh, not you. I'm not know. I don't know. I took it on my full salary. Okay, because the football coach took it on his official salary, which is about one tenth of his overall compensation. He took it, he took it on his pay. So his 10% that everybody talked about was effectively 1% of his two and a half million. He did take it on okay, his pay. So that's just again. would be in a good uh, position to give some scholarship money. Um, about sort of the arms race that we seem to be in. We, we learned in this course that um, in order to have a chance of having the winning team, you need top-notch facility, you need a top-notch uh, coach, you need to pay them these salaries, and that brings the best players here. But even if all the 12 um, teams in the top conference pay their coaches two or three million, so they have the top coaches, half of them, at the end of the year, will be on the losing side, half them on the winning side. So that means now next year everybody will have to double the salaries so in, on the winning side. That's Where part, does it stop? That's part of the problem because it's always in pursuit of. That's right. um, I remember in um, oh, probably, I don't know, 1995 or maybe 96, um, Barbara Hedges at Washington paid Rick Neuheisel, he'd been the, he'd been the head coach at uh, Colorado for um, you know, probably two or three years, paid him a million one or a million two, which at that time was outrageous. Uh, and, and, we, and I called her, I said, Barbara, what are you doing? He doesn't have the experience, he doesn't, you know, this or that. Um, and it's, it's always trying to, it's in pursuit of. Um, as I said uh, in, in the presentation, there's not a lot we can do about salaries and there's not a lot we can do about facilities because those are always going to be institutional prerogative, whether they be because of antitrust or, or whatever. But there are, I think there are some significant things we can do about the other spending um, to, to make sure that we're, we're playing in a level playing field and that we're, not, um, uh, that we're not doing things that are not consistent with the, uh, uh, with the mission of of the campus just to be keeping up with the Joneses or, or the or the arms race. So thank you all very much. I appreciate